Okay, good morning all, those online as well. Uh, let's cut right to the chase. So at the end of February, three days ago, on Thursday, we owed our pastor $2,000 from January and $5,500 from February for his housing stipend. For $7,500 on rent, we owe $900 from February, and as of today, well, let me get to March in a minute. Um, so that's a total of $8,400 in the hole at the end of February. So as of March 2nd, yesterday, we had some early checks come in the mail. We were able to pay our pastor $1,500 towards our deficit from January. So we still owe him $500 from January, $5,500 from February. Um, and rent, we owed the 900 from February and rent due today, $1,900. So that's uh, $2,800. So as of today, we're in arrears by $8,800. That doesn't include pastor's housing nor any of our other bills for March. So it's uh, quite clear that we're, uh, we're struggling. Um, a little history, last year we struggled as well, but not to the tune of the first two months of this year. Last year we had, we need about $10,000 a month to, uh, to continue to meet our financial obligations here. So last month we had five months, I mean last year, 2023, we had five months of $10,000 uh, in offerings or greater, but we had seven months under. The two lowest months from last year were in February of 7430 and in August of $7,800. So we always kind of managed to squeak along. I, I, we've never been, as you know, I don't like getting up here every Sunday and going over this, but um, we've last year we were able to, again, kind of squeak along by paying our pastor in arrears. And you know, he needs to live too, so that's a sacrifice that he's doing. So this year, um, for January, our offerings were $7,100, and for February, a total of $6,200. So we're trending in the wrong direction. And usually in the business world, a trend does not occur until three months, so I'm praying that we buck the first two months and we have a great offering for March. And that's not only from the folks that sit here, that's from our, our folks online as well um, that consider this to be their church because at this rate, we are definitely not going to survive. I've had a conversation with our landlord. He's uh, being very gracious and working with us. Um, I just got to keep him informed as to where we are. Um, but we're, we're not going to be able to continue without being able to pay rent. We won't have a building. We'll have nowhere to meet. And uh, we have to pay our pastor as well. He goes through great sacrifice in order to teach us here. So it's, uh, it's really in God's hands and in our hands whether or not this congregation continues. And at the rate we're going, we will very quickly be closing the doors here. So I just, I want, I want to put that out there. I don't want anybody to be surprised when we, if we have to make the announcement that we can no longer meet in this building. So with that uplifting account, um, we'll turn it back over to Pastor Jim and obviously we'll pray at the end of service that uh, that we have some people come and step forward uh, s you know specifically to help our needs here and uh, otherwise we're closing the doors thank you all at <laughs> hey yay 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 hey yay
<laughs> Thank you uh, for giving us that update. And um, again, uh, appreciate everything that everybody can do. I know everybody's always in a diff you know difficult situations and financials. Our economy isn't helping uh, right now either. So I know it's difficult for all of us. But again, collectively, if we come together and uh, support one another. Uh, then I think we can do uh, what God wants us to do and uh, continue to go forward uh, in his plan. So uh, let's all uh, also be praying on this uh, every day and uh, each and every day, and then just uh, do what we can do on our own individual parts. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, let's get into a lesson. All right, so let's go to Acts. So let's go to the book of Acts. And as you know, uh, we've been studying uh, the Gospel of Luke, talking about the resurrection of our Lord. And uh, in verse 49, as we're getting very close to finishing up that book of Acts, we see uh, the, uh, the command that he gives to the disciples along with a promise, the command to remain in Jerusalem, and the promise when they will receive, uh, as he says in Luke, the power from on high. But now we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we see now Luke writing uh, a new book, now talking about the Acts of the Apostles, which is really, you know, Jesus Christ too, because the acts of the apostles aren't possible without Christ working in their lives. So even though we call it the book of Acts of the Apostles, as it were, it's really still about Jesus Christ as they went out and witnessed the gospel and began the church. But in any case, when we look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, we see the reiteration of this command given to us and also the fulfillment of that promise. And so that's what we're noting uh, and going through that in uh, some detail now uh, in the book of Acts as we're going to study uh, Acts chapter 1, actually all the way through verse 11 in this understanding until we get to the resurrection of our Lord. All right, so uh, let's go to the book of Acts again, chapter 1 once again. And as it says in Acts 1-1, uh, it says, The first account I compose, let's talk about his gospel, Theophilus, the individual or a pseudonym for the individual he was writing to, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, that's his ascension, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So interesting enough, Jesus Christ still operating from his humanity being in view here, receiving a message from the Holy Spirit, now giving that to the apostles. And as I've been pointing out, the interesting message is, wait here until you receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is giving a command to the disciples through the interim of Jesus, basically saying, wait till I come. And basically that is the command and the promise that is given to these individuals. And then it also says, the apostles whom I had chosen. And we spent the last three sessions together talking about that word chosen or election, and also not only speaking about their election into the apostleship, but also our election into the family of God. And that great doctrine from eternity past, God had foreknowledge of your uh, faith and belief in Jesus Christ. God knew that he would put his son on this earth to pay for your sins. He knew that you would believe in that work of Jesus Christ being all sufficient in the payment of the penalty for your sins. Therefore, from eternity past, God's foreknowledge, he looked down the corridors of history and elected you into the eternal family of God. And because we're part of the church age, the royal family of God as we know it. So we went through some great detail on that and understood a little bit more about the doctrine of election. Now in verse 3, we're going to pick it up this morning. It says, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, and I'm actually going to leave it off there because uh, if we get to verse 5, uh, uh, we'll be doing a good job today, but we may just get through the first couple of verses, and that's what I want to focus on because even in what we read there, we see some fantastic messages coming forward. As I said, Luke is reiterating the command from his gospel in regard to the giving of God the Holy Spirit, the indwelling. Also now, as we see in verse 5, not many days from now, you'll be baptized with God the Holy Spirit. 
And as we know, that was not a water baptism, but that was the visible manifestation of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And that is what we receive at the moment of our salvation now and all throughout the church age. So as we now turn to verse 3, it says, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, offering to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. There's quite a bit of information right there, especially when we compare Scripture with Scripture in regard to what Luke is saying uh, to Theophilus and also to us as well, because this is now for us through the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. But basically, Luke is speaking of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and he also gives us the time frame. As we have here, he appeared over a period of 40 days. We're going to look at that a little bit more specifically in just a minute, but this is the only verse that gives us the time frame in regard to his uh, uh, resurrection to his ascension. And so from this passage, we know that Jesus Christ appeared on earth over that 40-day time period. And then we also see uh, in Luke's Gospel and then in Acts chapter 1, we see the ascension happening on this day as well, at the end of that 40 days. So this is the, the passage that gives us that time frame. And by no coincidence, we have that 40 days being in view. So we're going to see that and what that number is all about and what it means in regard to Jesus' appearances during that time. But we also note, that he appeared and presented himself. And there we have an interesting uh, uh, Greek word in regard to presenting himself. He made himself visible. He made himself known. They were able to see him, but he presented himself alive after his sufferings. Now, his sufferings here is the Greek word pasco, as we see it in uh, the book of Acts from the Greek. But that also reminds us of who and what Jesus Christ is, that he is what? The paschal lamb. So notice those two words. The word pasco does mean to suffer, all right, to undergo ill treatment, harm. We could also say sometimes the, uh, the punishment from a crime, even though we know he committed no crime, but yet he suffered undeservedly, but we also have the cognate of that word being the word paschal, which is that word for lamb, and specifically the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament as God had commanded them, and then used to prophesy in regard the coming and work of Jesus Christ. So again, after his sufferings, but first and foremost, he presented himself alive, and he appeared to them over that 40-day time period. Now, we don't know whether Jesus Christ, and I don't think he did, was here all 40 of those days. Maybe he was and just stayed here on earth for 40 days. But what we do know about Jesus is that he could appear and disappear at a beckoning call. And we have already noted that on the night of his resurrection, where he appeared and disappeared right before their eyes. And then day, eight days later, at the message of the doubting Thomas, as we noted in the Gospel of John, he appeared and disappeared right before their eyes. Then we see him meeting up in Galilee. So we see that he didn't walk to Galilee with them, but that when they were there, suddenly he appeared before them. So whether Jesus Christ literally was on earth for 40 days and 40 nights after, we'll find that out more when we get to heaven. But we know that over a 40-day time period, he was appearing and disappearing and doing some fantastic things and teaching during that time, which too we're going to note in just a minute. But also Luke identifies after the suffering, yes, we know that he was the lamb that was slain. He was the sacrificial lamb that took on the sins of the entire world, paid the penalty for those sins when he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Therefore, he took on our sins, suffered the penalty for those sins, and then he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. The work and the payment of the penalty of our sins have been completed once and for all time. And therefore, anyone who would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved, their sins being forgiven, they stand positionally before God, elected into the family of God from eternity past, as we've been noting this past week, and now they're part of that royal family of God because of what Jesus Christ did. But yet, after his sufferings, even though he went through that suffering, that difficulty, and then after that he bowed his head and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and therefore he, he died, breathed his last breath. 
that was not the end, as we know. He became what? Alive once again. And on the resurrection, he came forward. And on the resurrection, he demonstrated that body that had been nailed to the cross, went through the horrific uh, uh, treatment of the Roman scourging as well. He showed that scarred, torn body, presented that to the apostles and disciples, and I'm sure during the 40-day time period continued to present that body to people. But in the demonstration of, yeah, they tried to kill me, but yet, I'm alive. Why? Because I have overcome sin, which brings about death. I've overcome death. I've overcome sin. I've overcome Satan. I've overcome death. And now I'm alive. And anyone who believes in me also receives that same life. And we too, even though we may suffer death here on planet Earth, will be alive with Jesus Christ in resurrection form and body forevermore because of his all-sufficient work upon the cross. So it demonstrates the victory that he won at the cross. So that's why Paul brings us into this. After his suffering, he presented himself alive. And we have, I gave you in the notes, but not on the board, the Greek word zeo, which means life or alive. He presented himself alive in resurrection form, as we know. Then this was also an interesting word study and understanding of what is trying to be uh, given to us here by God. It says, with many convincing proofs. And that phrase or the two words coupled there, convincing proofs, is one uh, Greek word, which is tekmerion. And what's interesting about that is this is the only time that this word is used within the entire New Testament. Okay, So when Luke is writing in regard to the many convincing proofs and the evidence that Jesus Christ brought forward. It was in regard to his payment of sin, and now he is alive before mankind once again. And he won the victory over death. Now, this word, as I said, is only used once within the entire New Testament. And it, that's what we call a hapax legomena, okay? It's a theological word for you. But that means it's used once only within the New Testament. This is one of those times, and Luke chose this word, because when we have it, it does mean the proofs or positive proofs. But, and again, we have the translation convincing proofs, but basically this was a legal term that was used in the ancient days. And it meant dogmatic, absolute, fact of reality, evidence being provided. So as I have up on the board, it meant strong legal evidence. And isn't that interesting that Luke utilizes that word, strong legal evidence. And, you know, he could have used the other Greek word that we've seen throughout the New Testament and for the life of Jesus for the signs, miracles, and wonders that he performed, which is semion, but he did not use that. He used this word, and it's only used here, once and only, which means very important and something we really need to focus on. And here it's from a court of law, absolute dogmatic fact of reality that all the evidence had been given. All the proof of Jesus Christ being resurrected was given, and not just once or twice, but over and over and over again. And it's kind of interesting because not much is written about that 40-day time period. We've already done the survey in the Bible of everything that happened that the Bible records in regard to that. And what we've noted is about a couple of hours of that 40-day time period. But what Luke is also identifying for us is that many convincing proofs over and over and over again during that entire 40-day time period. And again, we don't have that all recorded for us. We'll know more about this when we get to heaven. Some of it happened in, in Jerusalem, as we know. Some of it happened up in Galilee, as we know. But there's a lot of territory of Israel in between that we just don't know. Did he go here? Did he go there? Did he go to Samaria? Did he go to other places? We just don't know. It's not recorded for us. But what is recorded for us, and again, you know, it's not recorded because it's not as important for us, okay? Because everything that needed to be said has already been said in the Gospels, okay? That's the main message. And it's interesting as, you know, we close John's Gospel. Well, how did John close his Gospel? Well, I guess if we wrote everything down that Jesus had done, I guess not all the books in the world could contain it, okay? That he did. And especially now we see during this 40-day time period, everything that he did during this time period. 
but it is not recorded for us because, you know, we've already seen enough proof and evidence, but Luke is just basically giving us that reminder. He gave tons of evidence and proof that his victory at the cross was won over sin and Satan and death, and he presented his body alive in many proofs. And again, in this many proofs, again, isn't the word that is typically used for signs, miracles, and wonders. Again, he goes to a legal term. But in that, the many signs, miracles, and wonders were performed during that 40-day time period as well. So the proofs of him being alive included not only just that he said, hey, look at the, hand, uh, the holes in my hands and in my feet and in my side, okay? But he taught. We're going to see in just a minute. He taught, and he gave them other information that proved who he was time and time again. And then we also can, uh, can uh, combat this against the lies that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Judaism were putting out. Because remember, they were Operation Cover-Up at that point in time. He resurrected. What did they have the guards do? Oh, they paid the Roman guards off and say that they overcame you, and they stole his body. Okay? So many lies were out there, and they were being disseminated and you know, uh, put throughout the city. And we even read one point where it said they even continue today, which means that the writing of the Scripture... So again, for many, many years, these lies were out there, and people were believing in them. But yet Luke is also identifying God counted that beautifully and even gave more evidence than necessary to overcome the lies that were being put out there in that early ancient world about the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ. So again, many proofs were given. And then, as it says, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. So again, this tells us the time frame, as I mentioned already. This is the only place in the scriptures that we know the 40-day time period of his post-resurrection uh, life here on earth prior to his ascension. This gives us that information, gives us the time frame, and therefore we know it. The word appearing, again, is also uh, a somewhat of a, it's part of a greater family of words, but again, optano is the Greek word, and it does mean to appear, to be seen. So again, people saw him, they uh, knew who he was. Later on, we're going to see they also received teaching from him about the kingdom. We'll talk about that. But it, it, again, this gives us that time frame in which he was here on planet Earth, but specifically the 40 days. Now, again, as soon as we say the 40 days and we just narrow in our focus on that, I'm sure many things rush to your mind about 40-day or 40-year time periods that are given to us in the Scriptures. And what does that number 40 really tell us? So as you've seen through my teaching over the years as well, and one thing I do like to you know, emphasize is numerology and how numbers are used within Scripture. Well, 40 is one of those unique numbers that we find in Scripture, whether it be in regard to the terms of a 40 days, that we have several of those, or whether we talk about 40-year time periods or whatever the case, okay? 40 is a very important number, and it is used systematically throughout Scripture to identify something for us. And what is it identifying? Well, when we see its application and we look at all of those messages together, we understand that it's a probationary time period. I find that interesting, a probationary time period. It's a time period that also can identify in regard to a trial, tribulations that individuals can go through, which also includes that word chastisement. And again, I put up on the board, not judgment, okay? Chastisement, but not judgment. And what is chastisement? Well, that's the word that we use for discipline. And sometimes God will discipline his children if they go wayward. That could be here, okay? But chastisement also just talks plainly about suffering. You see, sometimes, you know, we go through suffering we deserve. We make bad decisions, we reap the consequences. But other times, especially as believers, as we go forward in the plan of God, we are going to suffer on this earth because Satan doesn't like us, <laughs> and his cosmic system doesn't like what we're doing. As Angelina almost got her ears blown out again this morning, okay? He didn't like it. Tried to interrupt it. Didn't happen, okay? 
But the chastisement also speaks of that undeserved suffering that we can go through. Again, a, a great doctrine for another day, but the biblical application of the undeserved suffering. When difficulties and heartaches or trials or tribulations come our way, as we see Job going through that, and God said to Satan, there's no one on earth like him, the most positive believer that there is on earth. And yet God allowed him to go to undeserved suffering at the hands of Satan. And again, in approving and a reproofing of his faith. And so this number, 40 days, is an interesting number as it talks about probationary time period, a trial, a tribulation, and also chastisement, as we see it being utilized throughout Scripture. And again, just some examples. Now, what's interesting is that the number 40 is used a number of different times, both Old and New Testament. But when we have 40 days, it's only used eight times between the Old and New Testament in the entire Bible. And what's the number eight? Again, I'll give you that. Eight is the new beginnings, okay? Okay? And it's really kind of a number of resurrection, but new beginnings, you know, entering into something new, something new and fresh, as it were. And so when we have 40 days and we uh, recognize that number eight being involved here with the number of times that 40 days is used within the New Testament, we also see it being applied to the new beginnings and certainly to the resurrection of Jesus, he was resurrected then here for 40 days. And in fact, you know, one of the multiples of 40, or two of the multiples, is 5 and 8, right? So I remember my math from high school days, okay? 5 and 8, yeah, that's 40, okay, right? All right, what's the number 5? Grace. What's the number 8? New beginnings. Also caught up in this number 40, in all of it, its applications. So all of this comes to the fore. And when we think of other 40-day time periods, what do we do? We go back to Jesus's start of his ministry because what happened he wandered through the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights 40 days and 40 nights he wandered through the wilderness and he was tempted and he was chastised during that time tempted by satan and we see him coming out of that we see the three great temptations of appetite beauty and ambitious pride entering into him at that point in time then he began his ministry it's kind of interesting he went through that time of trial and tribulation. He went through this probationary time. He went through this time of chastisement, being tempted at the hands of Satan over and over and over again. And when he came out on the other side it, faithful, now he began his ministry. Now he went forward and did fantastic things here on planet Earth. So now we have the bookends. We have the beginning of Jesus' ministry, 40 days, 40 nights. Now we see the very end of his ministry on planet Earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Now, again, we don't know a lot of what happened there. We know a few things, but we know that he preached the word of God. He spoke about the kingdom, uh, and he uh, probably showed signs, miracles, and wonders during that time, but presented himself alive as well. So he did all of that. And he gave the people a time of probation. It was also a time of trial and tribulation as well. And it also signified something for the apostles and disciples that they needed to go through because they were about to do what? Start the church. And they needed this 40-day time period post-resurrection of Jesus because things are now changed. Remember, they were followers of Jesus, okay? As we all should be followers of Jesus. But when you think about their actual ministry, okay, they were really with him every day as their leader. And they, you know, every now and then maybe go off on their own, but usually they get in trouble when they did that, okay? But they all were following him, and I'll say it this way to give you a mind's eye, like puppy dogs, okay? That's how they were following him. And he was there everything. And yet he got killed, he got buried, Freak out time about now we've lost our leader. We no longer have him. What do we do? He's resurrected. He shows himself alive, gives them encouragement, gives them great messages as we've seen up in Galilee about what they're going to do and how they should go about doing it. And again, gave them time to regroup. Gave them time to regroup their mental attitude from what we were as puppy dogs to now be the leaders of the pack. Because that's what they did. They went from puppy dogs to be, you know, the leader of the pack. And again, if you think of the 
uh, I did ride in the sled races, okay, and those dogs leading, and there's one out front leading the pack. That's what these disciples had to do. Now they're the leaders. And with that responsibility, we know that they're going to receive great power from the Holy Spirit uh, in, in these verses, and they're going to have that to utilize. But even with that power, you've all got that power, right? We've got that strength of the Holy Spirit, but do you still freak out? Do you fear, worry, and have anxiety about this, that, and the other thing? When things don't go bad, do you wonder why? And what do I got to do? Do you sometimes want to just curl up into to a ball and go in the corner and weep? Yes, we still want to do that, even though we've got the Holy Spirit. But yet, we need a time to recollect our thoughts. We need a time to reevaluate what's happening in our lives. We need a time to think about what God is doing for us each and every day. And when we go through that period and we come out, we see, hey, God's still with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He's got my back. Who can have a charge against one of his elects? When we come out of that, now we're ready to go forward in God's plan. Now we're ready to do stuff as the apostles were ready to do stuff. So again, 40 days, little number we just kind of throw away. But in reality, it speaks volumes to us about what Jesus was doing with himself and with the apostles as well and getting them prepared to now go forward. And they had to go through this. Again, we see other changeover periods coming as well. How many, how many days did it rain when the flood came? 40 days and 40 nights, right? 40 days and 40 nights, it rained. Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. How long was Moses up on the mountain when he received the law? 40 days and 40 nights. And that's a very interesting one, too. Again, going back to the flood, the world was corrupt and evil. God needed to wash it clean. He needed to wash it clean. And he did it over a period of 40 days and 40 nights. And then the water receded. Now they could go forward as the angelic conflict plan was designed to go forward. And they did. The Israelites came out of Egypt as slaves. Now they're given new freedom. What do we do now with our freedom? We've got to be careful. Yo, we have to be careful with our freedom, don't we? So Moses goes up the mountain. God gives him the law. Here's what you need to do. It's kind of interesting when you think about that. We don't know how to handle freedom. <laughs> Our country is demonstrating that very well for us right now. We don't know how to deal, to deal with freedom, okay? Because when we have freedom, we forget about the one that gave us that freedom, and we just focus on ourselves and what I want, my desires, and, and, and my lust. And it becomes about me, 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 me when we have freedom. So God gives them a law, but they had to have a changeover. Forty days he was up there. Had to give him time to figure it out. What did the idiots do when they were down on the ground? They built a golden calf. Let's worship another God. Really? One just freed you from captivity. I'm going to go worship another God. He's more powerful. Really? Seriously? Forty days. That's like a month and ten days. <laughs> That's how quickly the mentality can change. And God gave them that time period. And then he gave them the law. Okay? And again, that was the law for Israel. For them to go forward in their newfound freedom and how to live unto God in a beautiful way. That gave them all kinds of examples about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, Moses gave them the law. Noah had a cleansing with the flood. You've got to start something new, fresh. Resurrection, new life. Jesus goes into the wilderness. He was just a regular Joe, carpenter, living like the rest of us, okay? but yet without sin. But then before he got into his ministry, he needed that time of changeover, and he needed to be reproved and tested. Oh, yeah, Jesus, are you going to be the man that I have sent you to this earth to be? Are you? Let's see about that. And after he went through all of that and proved his mettle, as we like to call it, he went forward in a great mission and did great things. Now, 40 days and 40 nights, they need a changeover. They need some time. They have to get their head together, okay? They've got to get their head wrapped around this new thing that we're about to enter into. 
until 40 days speaks to that. And as we know, they had, uh, there was a probationary time period as we see that, w- that probationary also being, hey, you know, what's a probation, okay? You should be in jail right now, but I'm going to give you a couple of days to think about it, okay? And if you stay clean for a few days, I won't throw you in jail. You're on probation, okay? We understand that. It's a time period, all right? But what's interesting about it is this is the probationary time period for Israel. Because the age of Israel is about to end and the church age is coming in. Yes, as I think on the next slide, we're going to be, well, we'll see. But as I've already said, he needed to give the apostles this time to change from old into new, old wineskins into new, okay? But also for the people of Israel. You've got to change from the law. And what Jesus does by giving the many proofs from a legal standpoint, That goes back to the law that God gave Moses up on the mount from a legal standpoint. God also had to get Israel to change their minds about what these idiots are telling you in these, you know, the the false religion now called Judaism, how they had corrupted it so. And I need you to stop following them and recognize the truth of my word. And he gave them that time. And as I also have up on the board, to give them the church age that would begin a new way, a new mode of operation. Now not just the Jews being the client nation unto God, now Gentile peoples would be the client nation that would build and support the church as well. And he gave them a better law. No longer are we under the law that we find in you know uh, 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 Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. No longer are we under the law. There's a better law now It's called the life of Jesus Christ, the grace, and now the information that we have in the New Testament. And oh, by the way, there's still mandates in there that we need to abide by in the newfound freedom that we have as believers so we just don't live for ourselves. So again, 40 days is a fantastic thing. The new law coming in, a better way of doing it. And in regard to that time period, As he was preaching and teaching, he spoke about the kingdom of God. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, you know, there's the duality of that, but it all speaks to the eternal future. What's in heaven waiting for us? And as you know, the kingdom that is promised to the people and nation of Israel. Remember, there's an earthly kingdom, okay? And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And there's going to be a new kingdom here for the Israelites predominantly, but we're going to be enjoying that as well as non-Jews and non-Jewish dispensation believers. But he talked about that kingdom as John baptized to enter them into the kingdom of God. What did they have to do? They had to believe that God's promise of a kingdom was coming, and they had to believe in the Messiah, the chosen one that would come to give them entrance into that kingdom. And Jesus Christ, during that 40 days and 40 nights, spoke to his all-sufficient work in regard to entrance into the kingdom. So it includes all the doctrines that are involved with salvation, whether it be our justification, our sanctification, our election and predestination, as we just talked about this week. All of that has to do with the kingdom of God. He told them a little bit about what heaven's all about. Probably told them about the angelic realm told them about the promised kingdom that would be given to them. But notice it's not the kingdom of Israel, okay? It's the kingdom of God, because that broadens the whole perspective to include the kingdom promised to Israel, but also the kingdom that is in heaven. And how do we get to that place? So he gave them some great information, prophecy about the eternal state, gave them information about how they get to that place, and showed himself in, as a great you know, demonstration. Look, I died. You all saw that. Many people know it. It's documented. And now I'm alive. Because that's what happens to those who are entered into the kingdom of God. Though I was dead, now I am alive. And so Jesus Christ demonstrates all of that. And when we think about this, this also identifies, again, from that Greek word, polituma, which we translate into our English as citizenship. But talking about the kingdom of heaven also talks about our ownership 
of that kingdom, are part of that kingdom as we are heavenly citizens, even though we live here on planet Earth right now. You see, as a believer, you're already part of the kingdom of God. You already have a heavenly citizenship, as we see in Ephesians and the book of Philippians chapter 3. Again, bigger doctrine for another day, but just a few points in regard to that. Again, the privilege, the rights that we have being part of the kingdom of God, the sonship and daughtership, the adoption into that family, the eternal state of that family. That's why it says, don't be looking at the things on earth, be looking at the things above. Because that's your citizenship. That's really now where we're from. And again, I think everybody in the room was born in the United States. I know we've had people come in the past that haven't been born in the United States, okay? But we all say, hey, we're a citizen of the United States. Yes, you are. But more importantly, you're a citizen of heaven. And everyone that believes in Jesus Christ has been given that citizenship freely and it will never be taken away and again when we compare the scriptures in philippians chapter 320 for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior the lord jesus christ you see that's where our citizenship and we wait for a savior wait the savior already came didn't he yeah he did but he's also going to come back and now we're waiting for his second advent because that's when we really get to explore and enjoy our heavenly citizenship and be part of that kingdom of God, literally, physically. And that's what we're waiting for, and we eagerly wait for that. And we live every day for that rather than living for the things of this world because it's all going to be burnt up. In Ephesians 2.19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, again, with the holy ones, the hagios, and are of God's household. So again, writing to the church at Ephesus, made up of predominantly Gentiles, no longer are you strangers and aliens. You see, you know, if you were an Israelite, you were a citizen of Israel. And if you came from another you know, country and you entered into that, you could come in and live and participate, but you were a stranger and an alien. You weren't a citizen of Israel. You weren't born as an Israelite. So you are a little bit aloof and uh, 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 put afar. But no longer. Because no longer are we strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens. Paul Atuma, with all the saints, that's Jew, Gentile, anybody that's a believer, we're part of the family of God. We're the holy ones. We are sanctified, and we are of God's household. So again, when he says preaching of the kingdom of God, he's talking about our polituma privileges and all that goes along with it and the blessings that God gives to us. Now, it looks, let's look at uh, uh, verse uh, 4. Let's look at uh, verse 4. And again, with time, I'm probably going to end here. But gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. I'm just going to give you this first part. Okay, and then we'll uh, get into communion in just a minute. And again, uh, Barry took up a lot of my time, so I guess I can go over a little over today. All right, he talks a lot, doesn't he? Oh boy! <laughs> but in any case, gathering them together—interesting Greek word. And I love, I love when these come together. Okay, it too is only used here in the New Testament, a hapax legomena, and it's again soon alizo, which means assemble, eat with, or dwell with. It's only used here in the entire New Testament and not used a lot in the Greek language of itself. It came to mean to assemble, to eat together, to dwell with, okay? So when they came together, okay, now they're down in Jerusalem. We know he gathered them together and they all came together, okay? So, oh yeah, they did that. Cool. No, 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 there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a lot more because this is a compound word made from a preposition soon, which means with and together with, and then another word called halizo. And that's interesting what halizo means. Because halizo in the New Testament all by itself means to sprinkle or preserve with salt. Isn't that interesting? I'll sprinkle or preserve with salt. So I'm going to sprinkle or preserve salt together with other people. That's what this word really means. Okay? That's kind of crazy. It doesn't make any sense, does it? No. Until you look at the Bible. 
and you recognize that this word halizo and things that were sprinkled with salt, and that word too is only used a couple of times in Matthew 5, 13 and Mark chapter 9, verse 49 and 50. But we recognize, as I've got here up on the board, when they would commit their sacrifices, they always had to sprinkle them with salt. Kind of interesting. Every sacrifice that was given had to include salt. And God gave command in Leviticus 2.13, I'll show you that in just a minute, what they need to add salt to. A lot of times it was the grain offerings. Okay, Couldn't have leaven, but you could have salt. And so what we recognize is that the halizo, or the salt, okay, was always present in all the sacrifices. Always present in all the sacrifices. And so as it says in Leviticus 2.13, every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking. Notice that, the salt of the covenant with God. Again, what's a covenant? That's that life insurance contract. It's God's promise and God's offer that he cannot take away. So that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's go to Matthew 5. get there get there come on Matthew chapter 5 basically in verse 13 itself and again this is after the Beatitudes okay of the great uh, Sermon on the Mount and again in in my heading chapter 5 starts with a picture of the kingdom of life the picture of the kingdom life this is the message Jesus is giving now in verse 13 he says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And again, you are the light of the world, the city set upon the hill, uh, which cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, if that's my old English, but the basket, but on the lampstand... And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. But if you lose that saltiness, you know, some people, we, you know, our, our day and age, we want people to lose their saltiness because that means a wise guy now, doesn't it? It's kind of funny, right? But in the Bible, it means you're a good, great, you're a good believer. You're going forward. You're like that light on the hill. You've got that salt. You've got that vigor. And it relates back to this sacrificial offering that reminds us of the number 40 and the chastisement, the trial, and the tribulation before you enter into that service. And if we lose our saltiness, it means we're not going forward in the plan of God any longer. We've lost that chastisement we've lost that trial that tribulation we haven't learned from those things and we're just going about life on our own way and we're not doing the things of God that we should be doing and if we lose that it's hard to regain it now let's go and see a similar but different application in Mark chapter 9 Mark chapter 9 because these are the only two times that halizo is used in the New Testament and again, Suna Halizo is not used anywhere except for in the book of Acts. So we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we look at chapter 9, verse 49, and then verse 50. It says in verse 49, For everyone will be salted with fire. I don't have to explain that, I'm sure, but I'll come back. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So Mark actually gives us a little bit of definition in recording Jesus' words here. Verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salted with fire. They had to 
salt the sacrifices, they would then burn them with fire. And it was a soothing aroma to God, an acceptable sacrifice. And it was a picture of what Jesus Christ would do for their sins upon the cross. Now it's relating back to us. You know, we need to be salty. And we need to be salted with fire, which talks about, you know, trial, tribulation. Okay? And it's interesting, when we look at Scripture, every member of the human race will be salted with fire. For you and I, the believer, that's the trials and tribulations we go through during our spiritual walk. For the unbeliever, it's called condemnation to the eternal lake of fire. Everyone will go through fire. So Jesus Christ is giving us this information, and Luke now is giving us this information in regard to what this 40-day ministry was all about, the chastisement, the trial, the tribulation, the proof of evidence of uh, something new beginning. And what do they need to change over to that something new? And I'll give you this. Uh, I've got a, a, a greater uh, a quote, but I'll read uh, what I have, and you can see what's up on the board. But metaphorically, and again, this is from the Complete Word Study Dictionary, metaphorically, everyone shall be seasoned or tried with fire, the wicked with eternal fire, as Ma uh, Mark 9, 47 and 48, while every Christian shall be tried or perfected by suffering so as to become acceptable in the sight of God. Just as every animal was prepared for sacrifice by being sprinkled with salt. Also in Matthew 5.13, which we read, which ass of salt, which has become insipid or unsalty, how can it be a preservative itself? So again, this is a great time period that God had the people go through. It's a great time period that Jesus walked through in the conclusion of his ministry. He started his ministry with, a, with a, a trial and tribulation of a 40 day and 40 night. He's concluding it with a probationary, probationary period to give them time to think about and be prepared for what was about to come. Because they were about to receive this power on high that nobody had ever received before. And all believers would receive this. And they were now to go out and build the church. And oh, by the way, as they did that, they were going to go through trials and tribulations and difficulties. They were going to be chastised by Satan himself, trying to destroy what they were trying to build, trying to end the Christianity, the way, as they used to call it, so that the name of Christ would not go forward. But God knew that these men and women were tried and true and ready to go forward, and they were given new power to go forward and do that. And again, as we read the scripture, yeah, we'll go through trials and tribulations. We may be going through some right now in all of our lives and maybe collectively as a church. But God designed these things to do what? To make us better. To make us draw us closer to him. To find and show that he is the only way. And without him, we are lost. And by ourselves, we will get in trouble. But yet when we follow him and go forward in his plan, go through those trials and tribulations, learn from those things, and come out better on the other side. And you're going to be more powerful. You're going to be more strengthened to endure and to overcome. And the trials and tribulations aren't always constant. There are ebbs and flows, but there will be. So be prepared as we are and to go forward in God's plan because he's got great things designed for all of us to do. And as long as we're here on planet Earth, and as long as we wake up every morning, he's got great things for us to do. We just need to go out and do them. And with his power, with his strength, we can do it. And with the past learnings we've accepted and adopted, we will do it. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and for all that he accomplished for us on the cross for our salvation. We thank you, Father, for giving us the chastisement and probationary time period so that we, too, can come out better on the other end, ready and prepared for the ministry that you would have us walk in. And so, Father, we ask that you lead us to walk in that ministry more faithfully each and every day. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Stop it, stop it, stop it. All right. Thank you.